Thank you so much, Joram, and thanks uh, everyone for coming. Uh, I want to thank also the uh, Nazarian Israel Studies Center for inviting me, um, and especially uh, Daniel, who uh, had the idea of inviting me. So um, I will, uh, with all these thanks, let me uh, let me start. So in today's talk, I'm going to be making four main points. First of all, the basic structure of citizenship, of belonging to a country, is undergoing changes in, in the, these years, and we see the global rise of dual citizenship. Second, this uh, uh, the opportunity to acquire a second citizenship has created a new phenomenon that I call compensatory citizenship, and which includes people from outside the West securing a second citizenship from a Western or EU country without necessarily intending to emigrate, but in order to uh, gain access to uh, opportunities, to rights, to travel freedom, to status that are reserved to uh, citizens of Western countries. And uh, focusing on the Israeli case, I'm going to talk about two aspects of this uh, uh, case of compensatory citizenship. Uh, so um, Israelis, I'm going to be talking about uh, EU citizenship in Israel as, uh, as a family gift and as a kind of property restitution. So we see very interesting dynamics with the acquisition of this citizenship. And uh, then I'm going to be talking about citizenship as a resource. And I'm, I'm going to show how uh, dual citizenship uh, in Israel is used as an insurance policy and also as a status symbol. So let's, let's start with these changes in citizenship. Uh, and these are global changes. So for most of the 20th century, countries did not allow dual citizenship. Uh, citizenship was exclusive. You could only belong to one country. And so in 1990, 30% of countries in uh, Europe and the Americas do not, oh, sorry, only 30% of countries in Europe and the Americas permit dual citizenship, 70% uh, do not. Around the 1990s, this state of affairs starts to change very rapidly. <coughs> Many countries are changing the laws to permit dual citizenship. And by 2010, 80% of those uh, countries already permit it. So this might seem like a minor, maybe even technical change, right? So it was a dual citizenship not allowed before, now it's allowed. Anyway, you know, uh, the, the number of dual citizens is not huge. 3, 4, 5% of the population in Western countries. But what I want to, uh, what I argue and what I want to show is that this change is not just technical. It is a change in the basic structure of what it means to belong to a country, and therefore it has implications uh, in terms of national identity, in terms of global stratification, in terms of the opportunities that people are facing, and even uh, it is changing ethnic and national uh, identities. My research focuses on the consequences of this change. So what happens uh, to, to uh, uh, national belonging when it is no longer an exclusive status, but when people, when you can start accumulating and collecting uh, two, three, sometimes even four citizenships. <clears throat> and the, the uh, basic, my basic point of view, I'm, I'm now describing to you like the basic framework, the context, and then I will focus on the Israeli case. Uh, my basic uh, assumption is that the strongest force that is shaping patterns of dual citizenship, that is determining who wants to acquire it, uh, and how people use it is global inequality. So the gap in value between the citizenships of different uh, countries. Uh, citizenship is today the status that, uh, that is the most important in determining an individual's life chances. The country that you are born in, the citizenship that you have is uh, what is going to determine uh, your level of, uh, uh, to, to a great degree, your level of income, the level of uh, educational opportunities that you have, <clears throat> your security, uh, also your uh, ability to travel around the world, all of these uh, things are um, determined by citizenship. This does not mean that there is no, uh, of course, um, very large inequality within nations. In the United States, there, there are huge inequalities, but uh, when we look at the world as a unit, when we look at the, the humanity as uh, a social unit and analyze it, and we try to uh, determine what are the factors that, deter that, that are the most consequential in uh, defining the differences between individuals, uh, we will find that citizenship plays the biggest 
uh, row, and uh, the figures show this very clearly today. The uh, average income in rich countries, in OECD countries, is about 20 times higher than in poor countries. If we look at the richest country and compare it to the poorest country, so we compare Norway to uh, the poorest African countries, the ratio of income is 100 to 1. So citizenship uh, uh, determines uh, access in, in a very uh, crucial uh, way. And um, another thing that's very interesting about citizenship is that it has become the last legitimate basis for discrimination. So um, uh, since during the 20th century, discrimination on the basis of ethnicity, of race, of gender, of religion has been very common. And of course, here uh, we know the, uh, the history. All of these forms of gender-based, race-based, religion-based discrimination have been uh, outlawed, I wouldn't say eliminated, but definitely outlawed and delegitimized, at least in Western countries. But citizenship remains a, um, an undisputed basis for discrimination. Any country can say we do not admit citizens of countries X, Y, and Z. Any countries, uh, all countries say we do not grant automatic right to, uh, um, to work in our territory for people who are not our citizens, right? And this is not disputable in the same way that uh, discrimination on the basis of race or religion would be. Just think of uh, um, the, uh, the president's uh, Muslim ban and how it is formulated in, in the form of citizenship, because not in the form of religion, right? Because this is the form that legitimate discrimination uh, um, has in the world today. So we know pretty much that, that there are huge gaps in, in quality of life between different countries. One aspect of citizenship and one way in which it shapes uh, life opportunities that maybe we don't think about so much is travel freedom. So the world's passports are not equal, and different passports give very, very different uh, rights of travel around the world. Uh, this is what the world looks like with an American passport. This is a map I took of uh, Wikipedia, okay? uh, and the countries in green are countries where American citizens may uh, travel without need for a visa or receiving a visa on the spot, which does not require some serious screening, just paying some fee. And you see that with an American passport, you can go to Canada, you can visit practically all Latin American countries, all European countries, uh, and many countries in uh, Africa and in uh, Asia. The American passport is ranked fifth in the world in terms of travel freedom. Um, and and it, it allows pretty free uh, movement. This is what the world looks like with an Indian passport. Wow. Indian. Right? So an Indian person, even though there are many, many people in India who have very high salaries, uh, they make a lot of money, they would want to travel, but in order to visit practically uh, any country except maybe uh, Nepal, they need to get a visa, they need to, do, uh, to provide the paperwork, they need to prove that they have the economic means, that they are not going to become illegal immigrants. Right? So uh, this is a very, very concrete, a very, uh, um, a very real way in which people who do not have uh, the, the more privileged citizenships experience this kind of global inequality. Since this lecture is in Israel, I'm getting to Israel soon, I, I will also show uh, what the, the world looks like with an Israeli passport. So you see it's relatively, uh, it's relatively good. Uh, the Israeli passport is ranked uh, 23rd in the world. It has visa-free access to 150 countries. Um, it, it does not give visa-free uh, access to the uh, U.S. And there are a number of countries that Israeli citizens cannot visit at all. Right? These are countries that do not recognize Israel and do not accept uh, Israeli uh, uh, passports. So we see Which that... Color? I'm sorry? Which color? The black, black. the black ones. The black ones. So Algeria, Libya, Sudan, the countries in black are countries uh, that do not accept uh, uh, Israeli citizens uh, at all. Okay, so uh, just just another way, beside what we know about uh, uh, wealth disparities and quality of life disparities, travel freedom is another very important way in which people uh, are, are stratified based on citizenship. And in my research, I'm not going to elaborate, this, uh, to elaborate on this too much now, 
But in my research, I try to construct a, a model of global citizenship value. So basically, to identify the different tiers of citizenship uh, value, and this is what it looks like uh, as a map. In the question section, I can uh, return to it. Basically, three tiers of citizenship value. And to create this uh, index, I um, combine the indicators of the four uh, aspects that I mentioned before. So uh, country development, the level of security, political rights, and uh, travel freedom. There are international indices for all of these uh, all of these issues, and I created a combined index. And what it shows basically is that we have a, a top tier of countries that includes the US, Canada, Western Europe, Australia, Japan, and South Korea. And uh, we can describe uh, those countries as offering the full package of citizenship in terms of all of these uh, um, factors that I mentioned. We have a third tier. This, this includes most Asian and African countries. These countries are below the global median in terms of their citizenship value, in terms of the opportunities, the security, the travel freedom, uh, and the uh, democratic rights that they offer. And we have a kind of, glo a kind of global middle tier that includes um, countries in Latin America and Eastern uh, Europe that are middle income, but also includes countries like Israel or Taiwan or Hong Kong, countries that are relatively, um, re have relatively high income but uh, do not realize the full citizenship package uh, that exists in the West, do not offer the same level of security, the same level of stability, the same level of travel freedom. Okay, so this is what I call the middle tier. And in this middle tier, this is where the action is in terms of dual citizenship. So um, to have Western citizenship, if you look at the world as a system of stratification, as a system of inequality, to have Western citizenship, citizenship from the US and Canada, from Western Europe, uh, this can be a membership, this can be seen as membership in the global uh, elite. And a position within this global citizenship hierarchy, so what citizenship uh, a person already has, this is what is going to shape their uh, position towards the potential of holding a second citizenship. So this is basically, global inequality is the force that is shaping uh, patterns of demand, patterns of acquisition, patterns of use of dual citizenship. For those who already hold a Western uh, citizenship, uh, there is low demand for dual citizenship because it's not going to add any further rights, any further opportunities. Soon I will give an example that, that will uh, illustrate it. For people who live in 13 countries, for mostly in Asia and Africa, there are few opportunities for a such citizenship. And as I said, what the action is, is all is in middle tier countries. Latin America, Eastern Europe, and Israel, and, and, and in those countries, millions of people obtain a second citizenship from a Western or EU uh, country, what I call compensatory citizenship, and they do so on the basis of their ancestry, on the basis of their ethnicity, they uh, 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 can do all sorts of uh, citizenship strategies, immigrating to a country, naturalizing and returning, going to the US or Canada, giving birth, and then uh, returning. All of these strategies are used to uh, secure a second uh, citizenship. And I want to give an example to this, to this uh, these gaps in demand. Uh, Italy, okay, Italy gave out. Italy is offering uh, ancestry-based Citizenship. So Italy has been a country that since the middle of the 19th century has sent millions of immigrants, mostly to the New World, and uh, it is offering us to base citizenship. So basically, if you prove uh, that, that you have a great-grandfather or a grandfather, or it can also be a grandmother, that came from Italy, you can get back the Italian citizenship, which is also European Union citizenship. Once Italy made that offer, um, half a million people in Argentina took up that citizenship. A quarter million people in Brazil took up that citizenship. How many people in the US applied for Italian citizenship? 25,000. Okay, now the US has received uh, about the same number of immigrants from Italy as Argentina and Brazil together. And in the last census, 18 million Americans uh, said that they had Italian ancestry. So out of these 18 million, uh, only 25,000 applied for the citizenship. Why? because it is not practically useful. 
because it is only useful if I already have a sentimental connection to Italy and I really want, I have some identity reasons. For people in Argentina, for people in Brazil, they don't need the sentimental reasons because having European passport is, is valuable anyway. Most of them don't even speak Italian, right? They speak Spanish or, or Portuguese, but they want a passport because they want to have a European passport because of uh, these reasons that I, uh, that I mentioned. So this is basically uh, what, is, uh, what is going on, and this is the context within which uh, we should look at the phenomenon in Israel. So just uh, three like main pathways, and this is what I studied in my dissertation. <coughs> so this kind of ancestry-based citizenship, we have over two and a half million people uh, in Israel, Argentina, and Brazil, and in numerous other countries that receive European immigration. Uh, there is also ethnicity-based citizenship, which is big in Eastern Europe. I won't get into it. Countries that are members of the EU offer uh, citizenship to uh, co-ethnics, so people who belong to the same ethnicity, who are in non-EU countries. So there are ethnic Hungarians in countries like Ukraine or uh, Serbia that are not members of the EU. They can take up the Hungarian uh, uh, citizenship. They would like to do it because Hungary is in the EU and Serbia and Ukraine are not. And hundreds of thousands of people are, are getting this kind of citizenship. Yeah. Didn't uh, Spain make that same offer to the Jews not too long, not yeah, too long ago? Yeah, I, I will mention, I will get to it later. Any, yeah, yeah. Any screening on this uh, either automatic or easy getting uh, double citizenship, i.e. Uh, criminal previous cases that have been cured or things like How that? How easy it is? Uh, in general, yeah. depends on the quality of your documents. So if you have... Um, if you have good documents, uh, and then it's not a problem. And it takes some time. For example, in Argentina, it became that once uh, Italy and Spain start offering citizenship, uh, in, Argent in Buenos Aires, there's a kind of AIDS island, there's a museum of uh, immigration, and lots of people are going there, digging up the ship records. So basically, it's just like uh, they dig up the ship records, they say, oh, this is my grandfather, he came from Italy, he came from Spain, and then that's it. It's not expensive, uh, it takes time. Um, these kind of ethnic citizenships require that you prove uh, your language skills or your ethnic identity. It's a bit more complicated. But still, we see hundreds of thousands, hundreds of, thousands of people acquiring this kind of citizenship. Um, the third pathway that I mentioned, this I also studied in my dissertation, is circular migration and uh, birth tourism. Uh, and um, there's now over 2 million US citizens in Mexico. Um, most of them dual citizens. I can get back to it in the questions section, section uh, if you want. Uh, now I want to talk about the, uh, the Israeli case. So we're talking about EU citizenship in Israel. Yeah. Uh, are you going to uh, talk, uh, tell us uh, a bit about what is the benefit for the country that is giving that dual, dual citizenship? Okay. That's a big question. Generally, I focus on the side of the, the individuals. I will say two words ab about it because I, I know uh, so, why, did, why, did, why this shift, right? I talked uh, like 10 minutes ago about the shift towards permitting dual citizenship. Why did countries make that shift? I would say in general that different countries have different reasons. If we cluster them, the countries that receive immigration, when, say Western European countries, they uh, permit dual citizenship because they want to uh, make it easier for, for immigrants to integrate in the country. So we know that, for example, countries like Germany, they are uh, a second generation, even third generation of immigrants developed that did not have citizenship because Germany does not give automatic birthright mm -hmm. citizenship like the US. <laughs> and they wanted to make it easier for immigrants to naturalize so that they would not have a, a big population of people who do not identify with the country, who do not have the citizenship. So this is why immigrant receiving countries permitted uh, dual citizenship. Why do immigrant sending countries permit dual citizenship. Similar reason, but the opposite. They want to maintain their diaspora. They want to allow their immigrants to um, naturalize in the countries of destination, but retain their ties to the origin country. For example, Mexico, for a long time, did not permit dual citizenship. In 1998, Mexico changed the law and, and permitted dual citizenship. The context was that uh, uh, over the 1990s, there have been more and more restrictions on non-citizens in the US, non-citizen immigrants. So um, 
more and more uh, Mexicans were, they had the incentive to naturalize, and Mexico wanted to encourage its immigrants in the, in the US to naturalize in the US and be able to uh, vote and have an influence, and, but at the same time, not lose all of their connections with Mexico. So we see that different countries have different uh, reasons. In the case of the US, um, the, it's mostly uh, about the US used to strip citizenship of people who stayed uh, abroad for a long time. It used to strip citizenship of people who voted in another uh, election. Uh, and um, it, through a series of Supreme Court rulings, it has been decided that uh, it is not uh, uh, constitutional to strip people of their, of their uh, uh, citizenship. This, is, this uh, uh, started in, in 1967. So this was actually one of the uh, first countries to uh, permit dual citizenship de facto. The UN, it is still not allowed. Right? So when immigrants naturalize in this country, they must uh, uh, take an oath to renounce all of their other allegiances and uh, civil servants, uh, and basically anyone who works for the government in any sensitive position is not allowed to have their citizenship. So you see that, that it's, uh, it's a complicated uh, situation. Let's, let's uh, focus on the, on the Israeli case. So, what are we talking about in the Israeli case? We're talking about ancestry-based citizenship acquisition by people whose parents and grandparents came from Central Eastern Europe um, between the 1920s and the, the 1960s, 1970s. We were talking about uh, mostly citizens of so Israelis who mostly acquired the citizenship of Germany, of Poland, of Romania, of Hungary. These are the main origin countries in Central Eastern Europe. And how did this, I'll say a word about how this came about. Israel has always permitted dual citizenship because it, wants, it wanted to encourage immigration of, of uh, Jews, and especially Jews from uh, um, richer countries, from the West, Jews who wouldn't want to give up their citizenship. Uh, and those countries, if we're talking about Poland, if we're talking about Hungary, these are countries that, uh, of course, did not allow dual citizenship when they were communists. Uh, following the shift to uh, the, the post-communist uh, transition, they, uh, they, move, they move to permit uh, dual citizenship, and they're even encouraging it. Why are they encouraging it? Why are they encouraging the diaspora to acquire uh, dual citizenship? Because, of a sense, because they're trying to achieve some kind of historical restitution. There is a strong sense in those countries that uh, during the communist times, they have been uh, oppressed. Many people, the best people, have emigrated to Western Europe or to the US or to Canada, right? The, the refugees from communism. Uh, these countries have lost territories uh, after the First World War or the Second World War. And all of these policies are aimed to uh, bring back uh, members of their uh, nations who have left or who have been left outside their territory. So we see that the move is a pretty nationalistic move. It's not a, a dual, dual citizenship in Poland or in Romania. It's not motivated by a, a liberal individualism. It is motivated by the idea of uh, making those countries uh, great again uh, by uh, bringing back uh, their citizens. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, a, it's kind of irony that, that Jewish people are managing to get the citizenship. They are not the intended beneficiaries. And I just said that in Germany the situation is different. Germany has offered a, a return of citizenship to, uh, to Jews immediately after the Holocaust. And, and it, is not, uh, it has a different policy. But when we're talking about these Eastern European countries, uh, they are not aiming it at Jews and Israelis, they are aiming it at members of their ethnic nation who emigrated, who were left outside their, uh, their borders. So they are Arabic countries, the Islamic countries, and they also think, uh, open it? No, no, no. Most of them do not allow dual citizenship. And uh, I'm not aware of such policies in, uh, in, in our countries. Uh, okay. Uh, data. What's the data I'm going to rely on? Uh, I conducted the 50 interviews with uh, dual citizens and people who seek citizenship, mostly in 2015. Uh, uh, about 10 interviews with citizenship specialists and with the consular officials from various countries. I use administrative statistics from, from those granting uh, countries. And as I said, this is part of a comparative uh, project uh, that also included Hungarian Serbian dual citizenship and US Mexican dual citizenship. Okay. 
Uh, so first of all, the basis, what are the, the basis, the basic patterns? Uh, we said that US citizenship has been allowed since the 1990s in those countries, but demand really picked up after 2000. Uh, most Central and Eastern European countries joined the EU in 2004. This is the case for Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic. Uh, Romania and Bulgaria joined in 2007. So only when these countries were about to join the EU did their citizenship become attractive to Israelis. So uh, we see that the view is Israelis want to get EU citizenship. They are not interested in the one, when it was just in the 1990s. It was just Polish citizenship. It was just Romanian citizenship. Then there was no demand for citizenship. Demand arose in response to the EU expanding. <coughs> the major granting countries, as I already said, Germany is the biggest, uh, over 100,000 dual citizens. Uh, Poland, uh, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. In total, there are almost 400,000. Uh, dual citizens of Israel in the EU, not just in those countries, but also from France and, and Britain and several other uh, countries. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about now, I'm going to be presenting some of my uh, findings, uh, and I'm going to be uh, talking first about the dynamics of obtaining a passport. Obtaining a passport means the practical uh, procedure of getting it, and also the mental aspect of justifying, of explaining why this is something that is good to do. And, and then I'm going to be talking about the uses of dual citizenship. So basically, EU citizenship as a resource. So uh, we'll start with obtaining citizenship. So the, the requirement, what you have to, to prove to get the citizenship, is just proof of ancestry. So this, uh, this is basically a document. Uh, ideally, it would be let's say, the passport of the uh, grandparent that left Germany or Poland, or a birth certificate that they might have taken with them. Uh, but for anyone who knows a little bit about the history of Jews, of European Jews in the 20th century, it's clear that it's not that simple. So uh, all of the Jews that came from, almost all of the Jews that came from Europe and Israel came as refugees. Their uh, communities of origin have been destroyed. Archives have been uh, burnt. So uh, in many cases, the, the, the spout of the, the Holocaust, the Germans, did not only eliminate the, the actual persons, but also their bureaucratic persona, right? Their records <coughs> that show that they existed. So this is a, a major challenge. It is often a major challenge to locate these, uh, these documents. Um, and and uh, this, this challenge is, um, so some families are just lucky, they just the grandparents, especially those of German origin, they are, some of them are tidy, and uh, they just kept the passport, they put it in a drawer, and they didn't touch it uh, uh, since. Some cases are more complicated, and then they have to dig up all, all sorts of uh, documents. It can even be um, like a school certificate, it can be a, a I said birth certificate, like some kind of a laissez-passer, some kind of travel document that they used to leave the country. It can be a variety of, uh, of uh, uh, documents. Now, that's another uh, layer of, of complication. Most of the applicants don't speak the language of the country of origin. So uh, we're talking about people who are already, we said these immigrations are mostly in the 20s, 30s, uh, 50s. So most of the, so we're talking about second or third generation people do not, no longer speak Polish or, or uh, Hungarian. Uh, and so they have, and these documents are in Poland, in Polish, or uh, in Hungary, in Hungarian. And this is where, uh, so this adds another level of, of challenge, and this is where uh, the specialists come in. So the citizenship specialists are lawyers, most commonly, sometimes just translators. These are people who are, who are uh, familiar with the bureaucratic system, who are familiar with the language, Often these are people from the origin, from that origin, so Romanian origin lawyers will specialize in, in, in obtaining Romanian citizenship. German speaking, German origin lawyers will uh, help people get German citizenship, uh, and, and uh, they really help uh, people get this, uh, uh, get this citizenship. So basically, a kind of industry popped up in Israel. There's many, many advertisements, uh, there's many uh, uh, offices that offer this service. Pay me money and I will get you your European passport. Yeah. Isn't this also an incentive for reviving the almost dead 
languages of origin, or no. the, the jargons of the people, like the Yiddish, Ladino, and the whole thing, will become more revived now rather than... Great, great question. The answer is no. I'll get to it in the, in the family, like in the next... Uh, I'll get to it in a little bit. But the answer, the answer is no. You know that answer, Nico. Uh, uh, we, still, we do say, so you ask, is there, is there going to be a revival, right? Because if, uh, um, if, if people are talking, if people are trying to get their Hungarian or their Polish passports, does it make them more interested in Hungarian culture, in, in Polish culture? And this, this, for example, if we think about potential applicants, let's say, of Polish or of Italian origin in the US, we might imagine that this is what would happen. In the case of the Israelis, this is not what happens. Because uh, in many cases, these families were poorly integrated into the European host country anyway. So uh, many poorly integrated, I mean that uh, they did not strongly identify with the country. Uh, they were usually bilingual, so they spoke Yiddish alongside the, the, uh, the language, uh, the, the national uh, language. And they had a very big traumatic uh, uh, break from, from those uh, uh, countries. Moreover, the process of integrating uh, into Israel was accompanied by strong push to forget the diasporic origins, forget the origins in the diaspora, uh, let go of them, and uh, just become Israel. So these, these languages are, are not revived during the, the process. What is revived is actually a connection to the family history. So this process of digging into the places where the ancestors lived, digging into the, their history, actually involves the whole family in a kind of collective reminiscing about what was going on. Suddenly, trivial, uh, uh, trivial facts on the life of the grandfather who came from Poland are meaningful because this might determine where he was born, what kind of documents he had, what kind of status he had, all of these things might determine whether they get citizenship or not. So people actually, they get, they know, they start to know more about their ancestors, they know more about their families. Often they feel more Jewish. They feel kind of like the Jewish destiny uh, um, uh, that is operating there. They do not feel a renewed connection with their uh, country of origin. Usually, in some cases, yeah. But as a general rule, not so much. Isn't that what created the first peace in the Middle East among the Arabs and the Israelis from Morocco? Well, wait, let's leave it, with, let's leave it yeah. for the question uh, section. Should we leave the questions to later? Yeah, let's leave the questions yeah. uh, to later. <laughs> um, another thing, uh, the cost, OK? It, it costs about 1000 to $3,000. Of course, it's cheaper for people who <coughs> do it uh, uh, themselves. This is uh, within this world of citizenship uh, that I just described to you, this global market for Western citizenship, right, with the, the birth tourism. There's another thing I didn't mention, citizenship by investment. I'm sure you heard about it in the news. People are buying uh, passports from Caribbean islands or uh, are getting uh, permanent uh, visas for the US or Canada. If you spend like a half a million dollars, you can get an immigrant investor. This is not citizenship, but it's a pretty good path to citizenship. So within this world of, of uh, uh, um, and spending money to get citizenship, $1,000 to $3,000 is very, very cheap. And uh, Israel is a high-income country. So basically, this means this is roughly equivalent to about half a month's salary in Israel. An average of $1,500 is about a two weeks' salary in Israel. So basically, uh, uh, of course, it takes a long time. It's not that easy, but it takes a couple of years to do it. But it means that this is that the, the ratio between the, the cost and the potential benefits makes it very, very, uh, very lucrative opportunity. In contrast, as I said, I studied also uh, Mexican birth tourism in the US. Uh, and uh, these are people who are upper middle class or so upper class in Mexico. They don't want to immigrate to the US. They're making, uh, uh, they're earning very well in Mexico. Uh, but they have to spend 10000 to $20,000 on getting uh, a US uh, uh, citizenship, right? Birth in the US costs like $7,000 if you pay privately, if you pay out of pocket uh, and with all the expenses. So just to get a sense of that this is a great bargain for, for, those, uh, uh, for those Israelis uh, uh, to get the citizenship. Um, and, and now, um, 
another thing that's very interesting is that we see here a family, uh, a family dynamic. So uh, usually in, in res the research, the sociological research on citizenship looks at an individual. So citizenship is within the context of immigration, and then uh, uh, researchers look at naturalization. This has been the focus of this research on citizenship in sociology. The immigrant, individual <coughs> immigrant, decides or not to naturalize. What we see here is that it's a, it's, a, 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 it's a whole family procedure. The whole family is involved. So eligibility comes from the immigra immigrant grandparents, right? Uh, the motivation to apply usually comes from the younger generation, people in their 20s or in their teens even, uh, uh, maybe in their 30s. These are the people who are actually going to use the citizenship. And the people who actually carry out the procedure are usually the second generation, people who are in their 50s and 60s. The, uh, these are the people who usually uh, pay for the procedure, and uh, these are the people who actually uh, carry it out. And this like, uh, uh, connection of three generations is a crucial part of this phenomenon, because it provides the motivation for the older generations to go through this. In a sense, they are uh, spending money, spending their effort in order to give a, a, a resource to the a next, uh, to the younger generation. But and by doing so, they are reinforcing for them the importance of the family. They are doing a very a, a important family thing together, um, participating in the story of the family that is going back, as we said, into the generations that were living. Uh, in Europe, giving a gift that is supposed to broaden the opportunities, uh, and, and uh, uh, also often during the process, siblings from the second generation cooperate, because it makes sense to, to uh, uh, cooperate, so they are also setting an example. They are also showing the, the younger generation, the children, uh, the right way that a family should, uh, should behave. So the, this wish of uh, of these parents in the 50s and 60s to give this as a gift to their children, to expand the opportunities, this is a major part of this phenomenon. It becomes particularly interesting when we think about uh, the fact that these parents are not going to use the citizenship themselves. We know, of course, in the study of, my, of migration, people over 40, 50, uh, uh, over the, the, do not immigrate, right? Immigrants are people between the ages of 20 and 45. So they're not going to emigrate. They're not going to use this citizenship in any uh, concrete uh, way. Moreover, the older generation, the people in the 50s and 60s, are usually ashamed to have this second citizenship. These are people who grew up, who are either born in Europe and came as young children, or they grew up in Israel right after immigration. They grew up with this sense of the Holocaust. They grew up with a sense of the suffering of their families in Europe, and they usually have a negative view of their origin countries, of uh, Hungary, or, or Poland, or uh, Romania, or Germany. Uh, they all want to belong to those countries. They also um, subscribe to a traditional form of citizenship. They don't want to be dual citizens. They want to be just Israeli. Uh, so uh, they're not proud of having this citizenship. They are even ashamed of it. The children, the younger generation, are actually proud to have the citizenship. <laughs> this is a very interesting thing. For them, having, a, having a, a second passport is a kind of status symbol. It's cool. It's something that's cool to, to use, to have. It shows that you are unique. It shows that you're original. It gives you advantages that I'll talk about in, in a second. Uh, so this is really a, a very interesting uh, gap between, between the generations. Uh, and about um, justifying the, uh, dual citizenship. So traditionally, um, German citizenship has been seen as an, ab an abomination. This is something that is uh, um, a terrible betrayal against both peoples, against both your family that suffered in the Holocaust and against Israel and Zionism. And what we see that in the course, in the context of this phenomenon, we see a various strategies of destigmatization, of removing the stigma, of removing this uh, negative uh, sense that, was, uh, uh, that went along with German or, or uh, uh, even uh, uh, 
Polish uh, uh, or, or Romanian citizenship and making it into something that is good to think in, in the words of the anthropologist uh, Mary Douglas. This is something that makes sense, something that, that's desirable. Mm -hmm. What makes it cool? How did the younger generation come to see this cool? There's a range of strategies. So first of all, the most important one is that Israelis almost never talk about German citizenship, Romanian citizenship. They talk about the European passport. Okay, so it's not it's not citizenship; it's just a passport, right? Uh, and some people don't even know that they are asking for for uh, citizenship. Some uh, lawyers told me about uh, uh, people that they were they were convinced that they were just applying for a passport. When they found out they were actually going to become German citizens, they said, "Okay, no, forget it." <laughs> um, and so, and it's European. People don't talk about the specific nationality. It's just Europe. And this is, we saw before how demand grew when the EU started including those countries. We said uh, just the passport. Um, another thing that helps uh, with this is all of those specialists. So for many people, the, the lawyers <coughs> that help people uh, um, uh, file those applications. For many people, just the act of going to the embassy or the consulate is very traumatic and difficult. Definitely for the first generation, but also for the, for the younger generations. The officials, uh, because, because you are coming and applying to be, a, let's say, Romanian, the officials <coughs> there, they speak to you in Romanian, right? They're not going to talk to you in English. Uh, so the whole um, experience is very uh, stressful for many people. So these, um, these specialists, they help mediate, they help uh, distance the applicants from the countries to which they are applying, from the countries to which they are going to become citizens of, right? And they, they have them keep their distance. Another strategy is that people say, I remain 100% Israeli, right? So they say, this is not going to affect my identity. This is not going to affect who I am, what I am. It's just, just paper. It's just a paper to make my life easier. And this is, by the way, something that I heard in all of my cases, right? It's just a paper. Um, so people make a, a distinction between my real citizenship and this paper that I got. Uh, and and um, two other aspects have to do really with a, with a deep change in, in the perception of citizenship. And this is the rise of, uh, um, of an attitude, and this is again global, it's not just an Israeli phenomenon, the rise of a new attitude that treats citizenship as a kind of property. So, Many, many respondents were using metaphors uh, from, from the world of property, from the world of economics, to talk about their citizenship. First of all, when they justified why they should get this citizenship, the most common logic was of restitution. So they said, this, this is something that's ours all along. I, I, I don't, I'm not asking for something from Germany or from Hungary. This is something that's already ours. If they hadn't done what they did, we would still have this citizenship. Another thing that people said, my family has lost so much uh, property in the Holocaust, we lost so much family members in the Holocaust, this citizenship that we got is the, the least compensation that we can get. So uh, again, this concept of, of restitution. Um, but even beyond this idea of restitution, there was a lot of talk <coughs> that just compared this citizenship to private property. So people talked about it as a product, they, one respondent told me citizenship was a cool gadget. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a luxury pro product. Uh, it's it's a, a lot of stuff that really compares citizenship uh, to, to something that you can buy. And from the point of view of these applicants, this is exactly what they're doing. They're spending money and, and getting the citizenship. Okay. So I'm going to talk just about one aspect of, of uh, dual citizenship with resource. I'll say very briefly. I, I show that uh, it does not lead to emigration. So I have statistics showing that this mass uh, proliferation of world citizenship in Israel did not increase the, the number of people who emigrate. So this means that people are using it in mostly uh, uh, non-economic ways. They are not taking the passport and moving to Europe. Um, the, main, the two main uses that I identified are one, one as an insurance policy and second as a status symbol. And I'm just going to, I see the, um, I'll just say very briefly, uh, talk very briefly about the insurance policy, and then I'll conclude, okay? So I'll do it in three minutes. Um, so what we see, um, basically, um, 
like uh, during my interviews with the Council of Officials and with the citizenship specialists, what I kept hearing is that whenever there was um, some security related event, whenever there was a war, whenever there was a major missile attack, whenever there was tension and peace, I don't come to Israel, um, then uh, demand, so they get a lot of uh, uh, calls and they get a lot of interest in, uh, in citizenship. And <clears throat> basically what, what this graph is showing, these are statistics that I obtained uh, directly from one of the uh, biggest uh, uh, law firms that deals with German citizenship. And here uh, what this, this line, uh, the blue line, uh, measures is just the number of inquiries about German citizenship. So this is a very good measure of interest because applications take a long time. Right? So this is about applications, but you don't know exactly when the application was filed. And this just measures the number of calls that the office uh, gets. And what you have in the, um, this gray line is the number of Israeli casualties in uh, terrorism or, or uh, militancy. And this is from 2008 to 2014. And uh, what you can see is that there is a very high correspondence between mm -hmm. these two phenomena. In years where there are a lot of casualties, there is also very high interest. There are many calls uh, um, for people asking about German citizenship. In years that are less tense, you see uh, less interest. And this is part of a bigger pattern. So um, here we're talking about response to specific events. But in general, one of the main reasons that Israel is applied for a citizenship, this is something that mostly the older generation said, but also was in the mind of the younger generation, was as an insurance policy. So the idea that it's good to have, it's good to have a backup plan, it's good to have another option, and um, surprisingly, many, many of my respondents, they brought up scenarios in which they could see Israel ceasing to exist whether through an Iranian nuclear attack, uh, through conflict with the neighboring countries, yeah. um, some kind of uh, um, ultra uh, right-wing religious uh, Jewish uh, uh, takeover, all sorts of scenarios that would make Israel unlivable in general or unlivable for them, and they wanted to get the citizenship uh, as a backup plan for that. Now, these, these are... Um, Explanation and arguments were really changing a lot based on what was in the news, right? So in 2009-2010, uh, when Iran was in the news, they were talking about fear of Iran. Now they would be talking more about fear of the extreme right wing, uh, uh, like uh, by the UD. Uh, uh, so I, I would say that, that it's not necessarily fear that is triggered by a specific uh, uh, event, but, but, but more a kind of general tendency, a kind of general disposition. And uh, I would even say that uh, we can see here a continuation of a Jewish diasporic uh, um, disposition, way of looking at the world. Jews have existed for centuries as a minority that is distrustful of the majority population and is distrustful of the authorities that might turn against them at any moment. So Jews are very, very um, attuned to look for all sorts of escape routes, insurance policies, uh, um, patrons, outside patrons, uh, etc. So what we are seeing here is uh, a lot of this. Moreover, within this context, there is also a concrete event from the life of the previous generation, from the life of the first generation, the Holocaust, that highlighted the importance of citizenship. Uh, the, the political theorist Hannah Arendt wrote uh, her famous, uh, uh, famous phrase, citizenship is the right to have rights. She wrote this under the um, influence of the events of the Holocaust. In the Holocaust, those who did not have papers uh, were uh, um, exterminated. And, and, and therefore, this, this message in many of the families that uh, survived and ended up in Israel are families that did find some kind, of, some kind of way to escape, which often involved some kind of bureaucratic um, um, way out. So this is a quotation from uh, Aviva, 54, German Israel dual citizen, and she says, I applied for the German passport to secure a safe place for the children and also for me. This is part of being second generation. In my parents' generation, if you had the right papers, you were safe, and if you didn't, you were doomed. So I asked the child to tell her this message, you must always have some place that you can escape to. So um, 
It even shows you the effect in memory, but and as I as I said, this is not just this specific event, and it's not just fear of a specific Iranian attack. It's a kind of uh, a longer running pattern that is activated. Uh, I'm going to skip the thing about the status, even though it's, uh, it's interesting. I'm just going to uh, conclude. So, um, what we see here, the, um, since 2000, this is the year around uh, 2000, uh, EU dual citizenship has become more and more popular in Israel, and this operates within a broader global context of changes in the structure of citizenship. We see uh, these changes, the permission of dual citizenship, has created a worldwide, worldwide drive for Western citizenship that involves people strategizing and modifying their characteristics and uh, capitalizing on, on their resources, so capitalizing on the ancestry, capitalizing on the ethnicity, converting money into citizenship, converting all sorts of resources into a new status. What this is doing to the basis, uh, to the basic definition of citizenship is basically changing it from an ascribed status, meaning a status that you are just born into and cannot change, into an achieved status. Individual citizenship now is something that you can create with your own hands. You are not confined to the citizenship with which you were born. Uh, and it is relatively easy, not really easy, but it's relatively it's global, let's say, to uh, accumulate citizenships. So the basic uh, definition of what it means to belong to a country is changing within this uh, context. And we see the rise of instrumental uh, attitudes to citizenship and of the rise of perception of citizenship as a commodity, something that is uh, bought and sold. And uh, specifically, when we look at the, the Israeli case, we see an instrumental relation to citizenship, but it is not necessarily economic. It's not directed at direct economic gain. Very, very few Israelis actually take the passport and go to uh, do business in, in Europe. Israelis who do emigrate, go to the US, they don't go to Europe. Uh, so uh, these, these motives are mostly non-economic, and they have to do with the kind of uh, uh, Jewish diasporic dispositions. Habitus is a, a word by the French sociologist Bourdieu that talks about a set of dispositions, a set of attitudes, a set of behaviors uh, that, that uh, um, uh, predisposes them, okay, like conditions them to look for this kind of insurance policies and escape routes. It also has to do with the status competition, Israeli status competition, that, that is also shaped by ethnic <coughs> relations between Chinese and Sephardi, which I can talk about in the question section. Um, and, and, uh, and finally, I want to say that while this, uh, the effect on identity, while it does strengthen in a way the uh, uh, sense of Ashkenazi identity, so the sense of belonging to this community in Israel of Jews who came from Central and Eastern Europe, and it, uh, overall, when we look at the effect on Israeli national identity, we, um, we do not see that, um, people do not feel that this makes them less Israeli. Instead, we see new constructions of citizenship. People, are, people who have two citizenships, they often uh, categorize their two citizenships in different ways. They might say, this is my real citizenship, and I serve in the military, and I'm 100% Israeli, but I also have these papers. So um, dual citizenship does not necessarily lead to a cosmopolitan world in which people are, are uh, um, just not belonging to any nation, but rather to all sorts of uh, um, different affiliations people have with different countries. Uh, and I will stop here and so we'll give you questions. Thank you.